Good evening. Welcome to Salem Bible Church. Let's start with 634, More Love to Thee. get a little chuckle on that first verse. More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. Not this week. <laughs> the old knee doesn't want to bend the way that it should, but I can get one down, so if we want to do some bended kneeing, I, I'd be okay. Hey, glad you're here with us tonight. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love to us. I know sometimes the world must look at the things that we say and and be confused that we could talk about love with a being we haven't seen. Um, tell stories of someone who we have not met. And yet to us, when we sing about these things about love, it rings deeply true. The love that we felt by understanding what Jesus did so that our sins could be forgiven. The love that we feel every day as we find him as he encourages us and guides us. The love that we feel in the midst of a crisis when we get a peace that passes understanding, those forms of love are all very real to us. And so when we sing about more love to thee, that relationship between our love for you and your love for us is very real. So we thank you for that. Pray that you might encourage us with it. Perhaps there's some folks today who are, maybe they're feeling outside of that love. Remind them, Lord, that you never move. It's us that steps away. And uh, help them to draw closer to you once again and feel that love. Thank you, Lord, for that. Bless us now in the time we have together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 781, face to face. Savior, face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me? Face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky.
Oh, 
you're here this evening, uh, kind of a normal week this week. We have uh, midweek recharge at 6.30 right upstairs here. Kids will be downstairs having dinner together. And this is art week for them, so they're going to be decorating. I think some birdhouses is what is on tap for them. So I'm um, pretty excited about that for all these guys. And then back together again uh, next Sunday morning and Sunday night. Uh, keep praying for uh, Scott's dad. Any changes this afternoon? So same thing, they got trying to figure out if they, they did cauterize one uh, area that they thought he might be losing blood in, but they just can't get the blood levels up, so keep praying for them on that, that they can figure out what, what's going on with that. I was talking to George this morning, you know, Mary Beth had that heel surgery uh, couple, about a week before my knee surgery, and she's been getting around, you see them where they have that, kind of looks like a little scooter you hang on to and you put your leg on it to keep the heel off the ground, and she was somewhere and there was a little divot in the pavement and that little scooter hit that divot stopped and she fell and so she bruised both shoulders and put some bruises on her arms so uh, pray for her for that and pray that she won't do any falling and I won't do any falling that's not that's not supposed to be on the list of things so and then of course Zeke this morning tell us about how he's going down to uh, Florida to help do some cleanup in Fort Myers so really proud of him for that everybody else going down there for spring break he's going down there to work so uh, uh, if you want to help support him in that, you can uh, just take one of the envelopes and put it in there. We've got a huge crew tonight because, you know, nobody was going to stay home and give up the, you know, give up the Super Bowl. So I'm glad you're all here. Uh, my plan is to get you out a few minutes early, maybe, possibly, so you only miss, you know, because nobody cares about the game. Everybody cares about the commercials. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's take a moment and pray for some of these things. Lord, thank you for our little church. Thank you for the things that we are able to do each week with the kids at Living Proof. I'm so thankful that because of the generosity of this church family, we're able to feed them every week and then just do craft projects with them, whether it's the building of the cars or this week, uh, the painting of these little birdhouses, the teaching of the word, singing of these songs that are so important to us. Lord, for all those things, we're just so thankful. And as we look at the condition of the world, in the way that they are trying to kind of run away from the truth about you. We thank you that we're still able to talk about it. So just pray that you'll bless that ministry and continue to give us these opportunities to teach them the real truth about what Jesus did. Thank you too, Lord, for the opportunities that we have to uh, minister through the internet. Thank you for these sermons that we're able to put online, and we just pray that you'll continue to bless them. Why? Because we are simply opening up the book, the truth, the word of God, and teaching from it. And we just pray that it will find a larger audience of people that need to know the truth. So bless that ministry. And then, Lord, here we think of Mary Beth with this fall that she took, and we just thank you that nothing was, was broken. And just pray that these bruises will heal quickly and that you'll continue to heal, <laughs> heal the heal. That's it. Say that three times. Uh, Lord, just watch over here. Same thing with my knee. Bring it back to full health quickly so I can get back to doing all the things that I like to do. And then, Lord, we thank you for Zeke and his desire to want to spend a spring break working with fellow believers and uh, making a difference in the lives of people who have been devastated by that hurricane. And then, Lord, we think of Scott's dad and this uh, loss of blood, and now he has pneumonia. And so, Father, this is a, this is a dangerous situation, and we need your help. And so we just pray that you'll intercede and that you'll strengthen him right now as we're praying. We just pray that you give the doctors wisdom. If there's another place that's, that he's losing blood, help them to find it. And that uh, you'll bring him back to full health this week. And let him come home, Lord, to the, the ones that love him so. So, Lord, this is one of these times when we need you. We need you to rise up and intercede for us. 
So we take these requests and we leave them in your hands, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 541, the joy of the Lord. <clears throat> The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no he heals the brokenhearted, and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted, and they cry no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And 602, I have decided to follow Jesus. <clears throat> Sunday afternoon nap thing doesn't become a habit for me. <laughs> I was just sitting there, and of course, when you're moving around like this, the leg is still very upset about all the surgery that I had done to it, so it gets real swollen. And uh, so I went home and iced it up, and then uh, I was sitting there with it up in the air, and I was thinking about this is a really nice relaxing position. <laughs> and I. Uh, I quickly decided to be even more comfortable in my bed, which is what I did. All right, so I was telling you this morning about uh, uh, politicians, and I'm deeply concerned about the, the way our politicians have been behaving themselves, the things that they do that really have no benefit for us. And this is one of these things you cannot take pride if you voted Democrat or if you voted Republican, they're all the same. Uh, when Trump was in office and he did his State of the Union, the Democrats were booing and hissing under their breath, and now Biden's given his State 
of the union and the Democrat and the Republicans are booing and hissing and that Marjorie Taylor Greene is you know, yelling at the top of her youngs, liar, liar. This is the president of the United States. And uh, you know, there should be no need for that. So I found this one, which I thought was pretty cool. News flash. Circus is struggling to find new clowns as top prospects continue to go into politics. <laughs> And that you even found the story of that Republican kid that uh, lied about everything on his resume, and he made it into Congress, and uh, he, uh, you know, he's been blasting about his stand about transgender and gay marriage, that's all bad, and then they found videos of him dressed up in drag down at some, something, you know, down Mardi Gras or something like that, and that's, that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, how about this one? Ten years ago... Uh, the internet was an escape from the real world. Today, the real world is an escape from the internet. <laughs> Isn't that true how that's changed? I mean, if you, if you are not concerned about it, you should be, because the young people today are paralyzed without those phones. And it's just getting worse. You know, you think back just a couple of years, Mark and I would take the kids on these camping trips of ours, and we would let them use the phones on the van there, but as soon as we get to the campground, you you can't use them. We're just, we're away. And you would think that we were pulling their fingernails out on the bus ride. And it's just going to get worse as uh, the connection to it. Now, I don't know if you've had any workers like this at your place, but I thought this one was pretty true. Boss comes walking up to the guy and says, uh, why aren't you working? The guy says, I didn't see you coming. <laughs> Anybody have any coworkers like that? <laughs> I like that one. Um, uh, all these next couple are just, these aren't funny. These are like, I just think, really true and important. When someone helps you and they're struggling too, that's not help, that's love. How about that? You know, that's what we're in the business of. Uh, you know, Jesus made it very clear he didn't come here to, to help the healthy. He came here to help the sick. And we're a part of that crew. So when people come through these doors, we're trying to help them uh, at the same time, we're still being shaped ourselves. How about this one? True bravery is following Christ in a world that hates him. Now, they might not say that they hate him, but they, they express it by the way they ignore everything about him. And, you know, that talking about him is something old-fashioned or archaic. I can't believe that you still do it. I mean, think about tonight. There are people that probably think we're crazy that we're having a church service when the Super Bowl is starting in five minutes. And to us, it's like, it, it's, it shouldn't be that big of a choice, and yet it is because the world, those things become far more important than the things that are found in the Scripture. We've had one like this, but this has a little different slant to it. I thought it was worth repeating. When a church changes their values to match current culture, they're no longer following the Bible, they're following the lost. Well, isn't that true? Um, you can't keep adjusting what you're doing in hopes of keeping a crowd coming to church. So whether it's the music that you change or the things that you, you do to attract that crowd, that will eventually change itself around because you are chasing them instead of trying to teach them about the Word of God. So, uh, Oh, this one. Ooh. This would be another one. People would be, okay, preacher, you're meddling again. Here we go. Train up a child in the way he should go, but be sure you go that way yourself. <laughs> you know, how often we got that do as I say. What is it? What is it? Do as I say, not as I do. And uh, uh, this is a true one. You can't expect your kids. I've been saying this. We've been here a long time. I've been saying this thing the whole way through. If you only go to church Sunday mornings only, don't be surprised when your kids only go to church once a month. If you only go to church once a month, don't be surprised if your kids become Christmas and Easter kids. It's the way it is. You are setting an example for them and teaching them. I'm thankful that I, I harped on this so much that my kids are getting it. So Grayson wanted to be in a basketball league, uh, loves to play basketball. So Shannon had to check all around to find a basketball league that didn't have practices on Wednesday night and games on Sunday. You can do it. They're out there, but you got to search because most of them don't, they have no regard for Sundays. They have no regard for Wednesdays, but you have to set the standards so that they know that Grayson knows, oh, why? Oh, because these things, seek ye first, 
the kingdom of God, these things are more important than all those other things. And so, yes, this is very true. I never, some of these I double check. I don't know if Spurgeon said this one because I don't really care who said it, it's good. Because <laughs> uh, that's very true. You cannot uh, expect your kids to go a certain way if you're not. All right, so here we are in the book of Acts. Uh, we finished chapter 17, and of course, we have seen this new pattern that we're talking about. Uh, the pattern is pretty clear. You find a place, you preach the word, some are going to accept it, some are going to reject it, and you might as well figure on having opposition along the way. We saw that throughout uh, chapter 17, and even this morning we kind of referred to it because we finished up in chapter 17 where Paul was once again doing it. Tonight, we make it to Acts chapter 18, and uh, um, Paul's moving on. He goes to the city of Corinth, so we're going to follow him there, learn a little bit about the city. As I mentioned, we're going to little, learn a little bit about the prosperity gospel. And if you hang with me, we may get out of here a few minutes early. I know it may seem... Still have a VCR. Do they make those anymore? I'm not sure. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for all the songs tonight. I love that. That one that's really considered a kid's song, a camp song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Though though none go with me, still I will follow. That should be our rallying cry. It doesn't really matter what the rest of the world is doing. We want to follow you. We want to be used by you. We want to keep looking for opportunities to tell the world your story. So thank you for that. Thank you for the examples we're getting here in the book of Acts of Paul, who is completely focused on your story. And no matter where he went, sometimes he left because he was forced out of the city. Sometimes he went because it was part of a missionary journey. But wherever he went, he simply began by finding people that he could talk to about you. May we continue to learn from the examples we're finding in this book, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 18 is the place. If you want to turn ahead with me, and I'll try to get there myself. I'm using today the, uh, the English Standard Version, if it sounds differently than I normally use. My, uh, my pulpit Bible, which I have used here for 25 years, is in the shop, getting an overhaul, getting a new binding put on it. I'm all excited about it, so I can continue to use it for, are we going to be here another 30, another 25, 100 years? Okay. All right, cool. If you're in, I'm in. If you're willing to stick here. See, 25, so... 67, 77, 87. My mom is 93. We could do it. I'd be not, you mean 94, I'd be 93. Can you imagine them wheeling us in the back? Keep preaching the word. <laughs> oh, crazy. All right, the city of Corinth is where Paul is moving to. It's a port city. It was a very popular city because it was on uh, two bodies of water, and there was an isthmus in the middle of it. So they had a port on one and a port on the other. So Goods could come in one port, get wheeled over to the other port, so it was, it was a happening place. So Paul going there meant that he was going to get a variety of people coming through because people would travel through the city of Corinth. It was also a place of action. They had another set of games that was kind of a step down from the Olympics, and they would play the year after the Olympics, and Corinth was the place that held those games, so people would pour in for that. The other thing Corinth was known for is they had a temple there to, the, uh, to Apollo, and it was well known for its debased nature. Prostitutes, uh, sexual perversions were all a part of being connected with that temple. So all of this is going on in the city, and Paul steps into the middle of it. And we know what's going to happen because years later, Paul writes two letters to this church that he establishes there. So knowing the background of what that city's going through, then you get to these letters at Corinth and he's talking about certain things that that city was probably struggling with. It makes a lot more sense. So that's the city. He pops in there and uh, let's see the next lesson. We finished up lesson 100. We made it to lesson 101. First thing you find out about Paul is he's a believer in the ministry is teamwork. So he arrives says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. 
So he's looking for some help. I'm in a new city. I'm going to find these folks. And boy, he's going to spend some time discipling them. And as we move through the book, we're going to find out how discipleship works because eventually Aquila and Priscilla, they're going to find somebody else and they're going to pour into them exactly what Paul is pouring into them as this chapter goes on. So Paul goes to the city. First thing he finds out is that the ministry is teamwork. You have to remember that today. Because everything we do, I don't care if you're a big church or a small church, I don't care how good you are, you cannot do it by yourself. Uh, you, we need one another to be able to do the things uh, that we're able to accomplish here. We know about it, right? Because they sent the first missionary journey. It wasn't Paul, it was Paul and Barnabas. And then it was Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Mark. And of course, then we know that later on it's going to be about Paul and Timothy as he kind of pours his life into Timothy. He always finds co-workers that can help him. Now, what's the advantages of having a co-worker? Uh, splits the load. But I think more than anything, for me, the benefit to me of co-workers is the encouragement that we get from one another. I, I would not want to do ministry if it was a solo sport. Because I love coming in here. I love getting caught up with everybody. I love knowing that I can call somebody if there's a crisis that's going on. Uh, can you come here and help me with this or that? You know, when we were working up in the bell tower, I was ringing people all the time as we were trying to get all that stuff done up there. And uh, I, I know I had, Mar you went up there once. Uh, I don't think I got Kurt up in the tower, but he was a help down below. Uh, but it's teamwork. And this idea that it is not a solo project was something that struck me all the way back in the book of Exodus. Let's turn back there. You might remember this story, but it is a reminder that it is okay to call out and to need help. You know, I've been finding this to be true since I've had this knee surgery. First couple of weeks, I, I couldn't make it over here to even teach. So I had to call up Uncle Jay, had him come out. Shannon was teaching the lessons for me. Mark had to do all of the bus runs by himself with Trav. And has Diana been riding with you too at the end or just Trav? Yeah. Diana, that's good. So uh, teamwork, right? Can't do it by yourself. Mark can't take 20-something kids home by himself. If we made him do it one night, we wouldn't see him anymore. There's 25 kids in that bus by you. That'd be it. You'd be just... So it's teamwork. And here in Exodus chapter 17, there is a battle raging. And there was something special about this battle. Anybody remember what was special about the battle? They would win when Moses would do what? Had his arms up. So let's see what happens here, beginning in verse 10. So, uh, so verse 9. So Moses says to Joshua, listen, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with, my, with the staff of God in my hand. When Joshua did as Moses told him, they fought. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur were up on the top of the hill, whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on the other, side by side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and the people with the sword. Teamwork. I mean, all the way back in the book of Exodus. And those were the days, really, when there was truly a leader. I mean, Moses kind of ruled the people. And it's going to continue from there into like the judges and the kings. There were literally, you know, everything kind of revolved around Moses. But even here, you see that Moses needed help doing it. Remember when Moses was first trying to judge the people and he was weary about it? And his father-in-law came to visit. What did his father-in-law tell him? Anybody remember? Get some help. You can't do this by yourself. So Moses appointed some other people to help, help the people, you know, kind of judge over conflict that they were having. Teamwork. So that same idea of teamwork is something that we find uh, here in our passage. All right, let's go back to Acts chapter 18. So you hear me talk often about the prosperity preachers of today. What's that all about? Uh, it's false teaching, in my opinion. It, it is these televangelists that kind of tell people, they'll take Scripture, there's a lot of verses in the Scripture that talks about God wanting to bless us. And so they take these ideas of God's blessing and they kind of twist it 
to say God will bless you financially if you give financially. The old, you can't outgive God. And guess where they want you to do the giving so that God can bless you back? Of course, it's their ministry. And so they're all over the place. You really have to search through the internet, search on TV to find Bible-based teachers because these internet preachers have discovered that internet preaching pays well. And so they don't mind buying the TV time. They'll spend a lot of money for professional kind of presentations they put up online because they know they're tugging at people's heartstrings. What do I mean by that? Down at our core, every one of us would like to have lots of money. We would say we didn't, but we would all like that. So you get some TV preacher that's talking about how God's going to bless, you know, and they're not, they're not shy about it. They'll come out and they'll say, make a pledge of 500, make a pledge of 1,000. Uh, and this has been going on for a while. Uh, even before the internet was popular, uh, the Sunday morning televangelists were out there. There was one by the name of Peter Popoff. I told you about him before. He was the guy that got exposed because NBC uh, discovered that his wife had a radio transmitter and was telling him about people in the audience so it looked like he was getting a message from God. Uh, He was the guy, he would send you a prayer cloth and if you tacked it up in your uh, food pantry, he promised you that your food pantry would never be empty. Of course, you had to give him a donation in order to get your little prayer cloth. Uh, Tobin and I were kidding about that back in those days and you could also get a prayer, a kneeling prayer rug from him with a certain donation. And so, uh, I don't know how Tobin did it, but the, the kneeling prayer rug came in and we couldn't wait to see it. And it was literally just a piece of paper that you unfolded. <laughs> They're all scammers, every one of them. God has never promised that this ministry and serving Him is going to mean that you are going to have money in abundance. Now this verse, Acts chapter 18, verse 3, exposes the false teaching of the ministry of of prosperity because paul is a chosen servant who chose paul for ministry jesus himself so if this prosperity thing was happening you figured everywhere paul went money would just be flowing in acts chapter 18 and verse 3 it says he went to see aquila and priscilla and because he was of the same trade he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. What? The chosen apostle of Jesus Christ has to go through ministry and work? Maybe he just didn't understand the prosperity doctrine yet. Uh, Maybe it was these guys today that discovered it. So I just want to kind of bring you up to speed. What does it sound like? Uh, I just went on the internet and I just put, put in the prosperity gospel, prosperity teaching, and we could spend the rest of the year watching clips from these guys. Uh, the popular ones are uh, Benny Hinn is one of those guys, uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Creflo Dollar. I mean, how'd that guy get that last name? And it's his real last name, Dollar. Uh, but I found a different one, and I, she'll, I think she identifies herself, because I can't remember if she's a bishop or an apostle or something else. But I picked her because she is not quite as mainstream, but she's got an internet channel, and she's talking about the benefit we can get if we just give and how God's going to just bless us financially. Keep thinking about that. And remember Acts 18.3, where the apostle, chosen of God, has to work to keep doing ministry. Let's listen to her and see what she says. I prophetically decree and declare Psalms 112 verse 3 over your home today. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endures forever. Amen. I prophetically decree and declare today, hallelujah, that you pressing in righteousness was not in vain. Hallelujah. That you taking a stand for righteousness was not in vain. Hallelujah. That you walking upright was not in vain. That you pressing hallelujah to do what is right was not in vain god said hallelujah to prophesy a release and acceleration hallelujah to prophesy a release and acceleration and activate hallelujah that financial breakthrough hallelujah and acceleration in that financial breakthrough being released upon your home in the name of jesus god said i am going to release it suddenly 
He said, no more delay. No more delay. Someone has been pressing, hallelujah, towards the mark of good. Someone has been pressing, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And God is saying, it will not be unnoticed. In fact, God is saying, it's going to be rewarded. God said, I am rewarding you. Hallelujah. I am rewarding you. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't be impatient. Don't be anxious. Trust the Lord today. Trust the Lord. Release yourself. Release yourself today from worrying how, how am I going to make ends meet. God said, not only is he going to make ends meet, but God said, I'm going to give you an abundance of wealth and riches over your home in the name of Jesus. I release a, a, an abundance of wealth and riches over your home today. Woo. Wow. Hallelujah. 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 And if you listen, of course, then they'll get to the part about giving towards their ministry, and that's help with the blessing. It's all the same, same kind of thing. This idea that God is going to bless if, and there's always the if, as long as you give above what you can, then God is going to spend. Not only are you going to be able to make ends meet, but you're going to get riches above that. Okay. Well, let's see how that works if you're a follower of the king. Uh, here we go, the truth. Paul worked in order to do ministry. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. I want to read about, because obviously when Jesus came here, if this is true, he probably lived in a nice mansion. I want to read about it, because it probably had servants and uh, gold fixtures. Matthew chapter 8. Beginning in verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side, a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air has nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Wow. Jesus wasn't interested in those things. Paul isn't interested in those things because these aren't promised blessings. These are promised shenanigans from false teachers who have realized it works because listen i can promise you anything who's going to follow up and find out if you actually were overflowing in riches nobody does it's just why benny hinn is always able to get away with these fake healings that he does because you know every five ten years some news organization will come along and expose them and then it fades because they've got the next story and Benny Hinn is in the next city peddling the same things. They're playing on the desperate emotions of people. Listen, if you have a loved one that is on the brink of death, or they've been paralyzed since birth, and you are hoping for a miracle, and you go to a rally where this guy is promising miracles, aren't, aren't you going to be driven to be a part of that? Sure. Sure. If you're struggling financially and you can't make ends meet and you're, you're worried about losing your house and your car and this guy plays on that, that dark part of your heart where you're worried about those things and he promises that he'll, he'll take care of you, God will overbless, you're going to give your last dollar. And it happens years ago, 20 plus years ago, that we had an elderly lady come into our church here and uh, Cheryl and I used to drive her home after church, and we had to help her because she was buying into this, and every month she was writing checks out to all of these guys uh, because buying what they're selling. And so we have to be careful. Jesus wasn't interested in it. And wealth, things, are not supposed to be our focus. Let's go back a couple chapters. Matthew chapter 6. Here is a discussion about things. And let's back up. Uh, let's back up to verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. 
about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or about your body. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? So Jesus is trying to say, listen, the world is consumed with these things. The kind of clothes that they're going to wear, the food that they put on the table. So he's trying to help us understand those things aren't important. What's important is trusting in God for those things. So then he uses the illustration that they would have understood. He says, listen, look at the birds in the air. They don't worry about sowing or reaping. They don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of their life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil or spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So don't be anxious saying, what am I going to eat, or what am I going to drink, or what am I going to wear? It's the Gentiles that seek after those things. So followers of Jesus Christ are not to be consumed with those things. So if we're not to do as they did, the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So where does our energy go? There's that verse I'm always reading. Now it has context. Don't follow after the pursuit of things, like in those days, of course, the word the Gentiles was used for people that did not follow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Don't follow after the path that they follow. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then, all these things that I've just been talking about, food, clothing, shelter, all these things God will add unto you. Now, the prosperity teacher would take that and mean, see, you're going to get clothes abundant and food abundant. Jesus isn't saying that. He's trying to help His followers understand that there's something more important than pursuing those things It's pursuing things that will last for all of eternity. So here you have very clear teaching that that this prosperity doctrine is not the truth of the Word of God. So be very careful because they've gotten very good at it and they'll take Bible verses and they twist them. There are some verses in the Scripture that talk about, you know, riches, blessing the riches. I often tell people, once you understand these truths, Paul had to work, Jesus didn't have a roof over his head, he told us not to seek these things. So then when you come upon a verse that talks about riches, it can't be talking about money riches because the New Testament has already taken that off of the table. So what riches are they talking about? We are rich in this church. We have friends. We have opportunities. God has blessed us in so many ways we are a rich congregation filled with people who rise up. Man, people have been given towards this boiler project. It's leaving us in awe. The fact that the weather was warm during that week, I am never going to stop talking about it. You might as well just get used to it because that was our Red Sea miracle we could all put our hands on. A boiler goes out in January and our pipes don't freeze. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. And who suffered for it? Mount Brighton. I felt bad, but unfortunately we had to have it warmer. I'm sorry, guys, but when you come upon these truths, then all of a sudden now you read verses about riches and blessing in a different light because you've already established in the New Testament that there's no promises that God's going to bless you financially because of what we see very clearly here in the things uh, that were happening. All right, we'll close up with two verses. So what does that mean, though, now that we've discussed this? Does it mean we don't support our missionaries? Our missionaries, uh, they should just go to the field and they should just find jobs. No, the Bible gives us a pretty balanced look to this. There were occasions when Paul would get to a city and realize, maybe I'm out of money, I I have to work now to support myself. But there's also a biblical model for people giving gifts to those that are serving. So let's look at a couple, and let's first go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So 
So here Paul is writing back to the church at Corinth, the one that we're going to be watching as he established. And he's continuing on his journey. And clearly at some point they wanted to help him or support him in this missionary endeavor of his. And so verse 10 says, So I thought it was necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift that you've promised. So that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an, as an exaction. So he wanted to make sure, you promised this gift, I'm going to go there, I'm going to get it, kind of thank you for it. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 4. Sorry about that, I keep skipping past it. Philippians chapter 4, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here we have another example that, uh, yeah, sometimes you support your missionaries. You know, we've had it here for a while. We've had a couple of missionaries that have gone to other areas where they worked and taught English as a second language. That's a great way to get into a country sometimes, actually be paid to teach English, and at the same time, you're doing missionary work by inviting these people into your home. So yes, sometimes there's the occasion where you may work, and then there is this example where we support. These days, all of the missionaries that we support are not working outside. They are uh, able to do ministry because we give. So either one is a good model. If we had somebody come in that said they're going to go to another place and they're going to work as a tent maker and they only need a small amount, uh, that would be fine too. Uh, the point is that all of these stories are a reminder to us that even when you read about this gift that Paul says was a fragrant offering pleasing to God, you notice he didn't tack on to the end of it and my God will supply your, what did he say? Need. It didn't say, my God will have you overflowing with money, as Our Lady said in the thing. So every time you come upon one of these stories, you find another reminder that false teaching is going on everywhere, and we have to be very careful and use these opportunities when something like this comes up, Acts 18.3, to remind people that prosperity teaching is just another false moment. And I'm going to tell you right now, those teachers are going to hear those very words. They're going to say, didn't I preach? Didn't I post videos on YouTube? And you know what they're going to hear? Depart from me. I never knew thee. Lord, thank you so much for the truth that comes from the Word of God. Pray that you uh, might continue to open our eyes. We know there's a lot of people out there that are teaching falsehood. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that you will help people to find sermons that are posted that teach the truth that will limit some of the damage that these false teachers are doing. Watch over us now as we travel home, Lord. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you Wednesday.